This is Felisa Elwine in the Creation Gospel. Welcome back to our series, The Spirit-Filled Family. We're looking at the different aspects of family life in terms of husbands, wives, children, and eventually we might even talk about those spirit-filled singles because we understand this is foundational. A spirit-filled family is foundational to a spirit-filled congregation. A spirit-filled congregation is foundational to a spirit-filled body of Messiah. That's why it says in Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come. Which is it? The spirit or the bride? Well, if the spirit is in the bride, then the bride says, come. Both are true. But we want the same thing within our families. We want the spirit working within families as we observe the commandments of the Torah as we try to be those lamps of the commandments of the mitzvot, we want it to be the Spirit that's shining through. We don't want to just check off the boxes. Now, in the last few programs, we've been looking at the obligations of husbands in relation to their wives and their families. And we looked at that foundational scripture in Exodus 21.10 that describes the three irreducible obligations of a husband toward his wife. And as we said, those three things are the, the foundation of Jewish law concerning marriage. And in the past programs, we unpacked not just the physical meaning of each of those three requirements of food, clothing, and conjugal rights. We unpacked the spiritual meaning of it as well. Because we know that Paul said the physical is revealed first, then the spiritual. Well, sometimes just looking at the physical, we forget to ask or even look for the spiritual. But that's not the way that the Father in Heaven wants us to conduct our lives. He doesn't want us to conduct our lives merely at a physical level. He wants us to engage all parts of who we are as human beings. Spirit, soul, body. Ruach, nefesh, and goof. And when we begin to engage His commandments with a wholeness, with a peace, then what we see is that we can be light in the earth. We can be that city set on a hill. Now, in the last program, we looked specifically at the Onah as one of the requirements that is placed upon husbands in relation to their wives. And we defined the Onah. It can mean a period of time, specifically referring to time, actually. And we talked about it as being a holy time because it's also translated as conjugal rights. So it's a time of intimacy between a husband and a wife. Now, as we unpacked that commandment, what we realized, just like the food and the clothing, is that it had a much deeper spiritual meaning than simply cohabitation, that these three obligations of a husband are actually reciprocal in some way, that when he covers his wife, the implication is that he covers himself. When he reveals his inner flesh, when he gives that food to his wife, that in essence he is also feeding himself, just like Adam said, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. I'm actually seeing a reflection of myself in my wife. And with the Onah, the same principle applies. And, and we looked at some scriptures from the Chadashah that show how these commandments are mutual in terms of you cannot withhold from one another without mutual consent. It has to be something that you arrive at by agreement. And therefore, the idea of the Onah is that it must be mutually beneficial and satisfying to both partners. Now, we're not just pulling that out of Exodus 21.10. There's actually another scripture, and I think in the last program I said we'd take a look at it to get a little bit more clarity, uh, because Ephesians 5, at least, makes it clear that a husband is to love his wife like he loves his own body. He must seek her happiness. He must seek her pleasure at least equally as much as his own. Because remember, she is flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. If she is not mutually happy 
when he fulfills these commandments, then he has failed actually to fulfill the spirit of the commandment. So let's look a little bit and say, well, where are you, where are you getting that? Other than the reciprocal nature of those three commandments in Exodus 21.10, we can also go to Deuteronomy 24.5. Deuteronomy, Devarim, 24.5. And again, it seems like this instruction is given out of a context of simply marriage instructions. But when you think about it, the Torah rarely just gives you topical instructions. It seems to weave them in with other things. And when we see that, we know that it's also teaching um, several concepts together, but that these concepts are somehow related to one another. And it's fun when we study the Torah portions to kind of tease out what those connections might be. In this particular context, Deuteronomy 24, 5, it's uh, talking about when a husband needs to go out to war. However, he's newly married when he's taken a wife. Or he may be actually, when we think of the process of Jewish marriage, at this point it's possible he was only betrothed. Because even at the betrothal stage of the process in Jewish law, he's considered married. And neither party is free to do what they want once that betrothal has taken place. Same way with Joseph and Mary. It talks about their betrothal. And before he understood um, what was going on with her pregnancy, it said he was willing to put her away privately. In other words, even though they were only betrothed and had never cohabited, there was a need there to formally divorce her in order to break this agreement. So when you read that in the Torah, recognize that when it says when a man takes a new wife, it could be talking about from betrothal to the actual consummation, or she may actually be that new wife. You know, they might be newlyweds. But it says when a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army, nor be charged with any duty. He shall be free at home one year, and shall give happiness to his wife, whom he has taken. All right, that's a, a pretty foundational concept. If we think of a time of war, in our way of thinking, if the enemy's on the doorstep, you need to suit up, grab your gun, and go. But in the, the Torah life, if you have taken a new wife, then you should not go out with the army or any of those collateral duties that go along with the army. Uh, in other words, your primary duty during that first year of marriage is basically to learn how to make your wife happy. So no, guys, this is not the impossible commandment. It's just not easy to make your wife happy sometimes. But that's why you need a whole year at home first before you face any huge responsibilities so that you can spend that first year learning what it takes to make her happy. Now, it's not her job to make that an impossibility, but sometimes it may feel like an impossibility because men and women really are quite different in what brings them happiness and fulfillment. It's an important commandment. But what a husband has to acknowledge, based on this mitzvah in the Torah, is that he is responsible for his wife's happiness. Not the impossible commandment, just unnatural. You say, well, how can I be responsible for someone else's happiness? If, if they choose not to be happy, how can I help that? Well, you really can't help that. But your responsibility lies in trying to figure out how to make her happy. Now, remember, we said that these commandments are reciprocal, whereas the responsibility may be given to a husband what we see later on in the, the Brit Chodesha is that the responsibility also lies maybe with the wife, with the other partner. 
So it's not as though the wife has no responsibility to figure out what makes her husband happy. But typically, wives will try to figure that out. If they know you don't like Brussels sprouts, they probably won't cook Brussels sprouts. And if they do cook Brussels sprouts and she knows you don't like Brussels sprouts, why did you pick her? <laughs> that, that would seem a little odd. And that's why we talked in previous programs how so much time really needs to be invested in the courtship process so that you can find out what are your common goals. Find out if you're compatible. Because you want to find the good wife, a wife who you can trust, a wife who is going to bring you good and not evil all the days of your life. So even though she also is responsible, the primary responsibility is resting here upon the husband. And that primary responsibility is expressed within that commandment. That for that first year, when he wakes up every single day, it is his obligation to try to figure out how to cheer up his wife. Some translations say he shall cheer up his wife. And you're thinking, well, why is she sad if <laughs> she's a newlywed? But it shows you that he needs to take some responsibility right up front for her emotional well-being. Because we know with women, especially, you know, at least physically in the realm of how our hormonal changes are, um, it is much more difficult for us to maintain altitude and fly steady because we're pretty much at the, the mercy of the way that we have been created as women. And so a lot of times we will see more fluctuations in mood and so forth than men who do tend to kind of get their altitude and fly steady. And every now and then you'll run into one that tends to sulk or fly off the handle. But we're talking about general characteristics, not all defining characteristics. So 365 days after he's married, a man has to wake up in the morning and say, hmm, what will make my wife happy today? It's my responsibility. And you know, it's, it's actually a training in the spirit for him to do that because he wakes up with that idea of how can I learn to make my wife happy today and give her joy? Since it's not really a suggestion, it is a commandment. That's going to be a training process because if he does this every day for a year, what are the odds he's going to abandon this once that year passes? Do we think that after one year, he says, well, I'm no longer responsible to bring joy to my wife, and I don't really care how she feels anymore? That wouldn't be a year well invested. But after you do something 365 times, it's pretty well embedded. It's pretty much muscle memory, if we want to call it that. And so... That's a beautiful way of training a husband to look at his wife, accept an obligation for her well-being, because if he, can, if he can disciple his own family, then he's going to be much more effective at discipling, say, a congregation, a fellowship of people, co-workers within the workplace, peers, friends, and so forth, because it is a skill. And it is other-oriented. You know, when we learn about the spirit of reverence, we talk about how the, the, the evidence of the spirit of reverence, not just to Adonai, but that that respect extends toward other people, using Cain and Abel as the example. Abel respected Adonai enough to respect his brother with a first fruits of his flock with the best, knowing that his brother is going to share in that sacrifice. He's going to be part of the barbecue. But when you withhold the best, like Cain did, it just says he brought of the fruit of the ground. He did not bring his first fruits. All right. Who suffered from that? Who was deprived of his first fruits? Was Elohim literally going to eat his first fruits? Or was he going to set it aside for him, understanding that it would be his brother, his own family, 
who would share in that sacrifice and would derive the benefits of his bringing the best. So in terms of the spirit of reverence, we see that it says Elohim had no respect to Cain's offering. When you disrespect your family, how do you expect the Holy One to respect you? How can you bring him an offering that he'll have any regard for? But, as we read in Paul's instructions to Timothy, if you don't provide for the members of your own house, you're worse than an infidel. You're, you're like an unbeliever. You're worse than an unbeliever because you know better. Right? So if we want Adonai to respect the offerings and the prayers that we bring to him, then step one is to render the proper respect to those closest to us within our own household, as it's described. So a lot of times today, most people I don't think even know about this mitzvah, much less practice it. And as we look at sometimes the state of marriage disrepair, not just in the world, but even within the believing community. A lot of times there are great fractures within marriages. The, the marriages are cold. The marriages are pulling in different directions, which is wearing them both out. Because if you're yoked up together and you're pulling in different directions, you don't get anywhere. You just get tired. And so a lot of people, they're just tired because they're unequally yoked. And it's not that they couldn't be equally yoked. It's just that they're not sharing the same vision. And the only way to acquire that vision, like we said with Exodus 21.10, where it comes back to revealing your inner self, your, your deep, the deepest part of who you are, and exposing your own weakness, exposing yourself to that other person, and trusting that person with those deepest fears, concerns, hopes, dreams, and so forth. That process, it's so important because if we skip it, if we didn't train ourselves in that Yurat Adonai, the reverence of Adonai, by rendering to those closest to us the proper respect, it follows that everything else is going to be difficult because we didn't do the first thing. You know, it's like trying to do math without doing the first step. How are you ever going to do a math problem if you don't do the first step? Well, we were embarking upon marriages, and like I say, it's even within the believing community, and these marriages are skipping the first step hundreds and thousands of dollars will be spent on the marriage itself. They'll be spent on invitations, on cakes, on catering, on facilities, on dresses and suits and honeymoons and, and all these sorts of things. I mean, their wealth is focused pretty much in the physical realm. But those things really aren't foundational in the life of the Torah, in the life that we are commanded to conduct, because the specific commandments concerning marriage in the Torah have to do with very basic things. But in those very basic things are the foundation stones of a lasting marriage, not just a marriage that looks pretty on a video or on a card. Maybe we're majoring on the minors. Not that those things aren't important. They are important. It's a mitzvah to marry. It's a celebration. But what happens the day after? If we're conducting that first year in transgression of the Torah, and transgression of the Torah is sin. If a wife hasn't had her happy year, we might have skipped the first step in terms of the growth of this marriage. And we might be able to explain why the problems have developed over the years, because there has been no practice or training introduced into the marriage that teaches the husband how to regard 
the needs of his wife and to consider the needs of his wife and what it will take to bring her to a state of well-being, to a state of joy. Because remember, if he starts that habit, it's going to be really hard to stop it after 365 days. If that's a consciousness built over a year, it's going to be difficult to unlearn it and to undo it. And why would he even want to do that? He wouldn't. He would want to continue in that spirit toward his wife to build good in his relationship. So when marriages hit a snag, you know, sometimes people will come to you for counseling, and I'm not much of a counselor. But one thing I like to always ask up front is, did she have her happy year? And most people have no idea what you're talking about. What do you mean a happy year? Well, it's in the Bible, actually, that no other responsibility to a husband in that first year is as important as being with his wife, making her happy, giving her joy, learning how to do that. I mean, the things that, that we would say, get up and go and take care of that because that's the most important thing. The Torah says, no, that's not the most important thing. Learning how to make your wife happy is actually more important than going to war. It's more important than any other civil obligation that you may have. That's your first priority. You build that foundation stone, and actually you're going to be a better soldier in the long run. You know, and this is uh, so counterintuitive. Again, so many times the commandments we receive, we tend to ignore them because they're counterintuitive to what the natural man says. But that's where faith comes in. Until I do more than just believe that the word is true, but I actually act according to the word in terms of obedience or remembrance, then I really haven't embedded the principle. I've only engaged it at a very superficial level. But in order to engage it at a spiritual level, it's going to require an obedience. I can't just spiritually engage it. It has to be followed up with the physical commandment. So when you ask that question, did she have her happy year? A lot of times the answer is no. I don't even know what you're talking about. And so you can follow and say, hey, let's go to this verse right here. In fact, we can even go back to Exodus 21.10 and then follow it up with Deuteronomy and say, look at just these two very small commandments in relation to a marriage. And both of these commandments speak primarily, or first of all, to a husband. Did you as a husband give your wife her happy year, your inner flesh, your trust, and your time? Did you give her those things? And typically the answer is, I didn't even know about the happy year. You say, okay, are you willing to back up and go back and lay down that stone in the foundation? Well, most of the time, you don't get a yes <laughs> for some reason. And I think, you know, so many people are coming into the knowledge of the Torah late in life, and they're learning commandments that they never did before. And when they read it, they say, oh, yes, I want to do that. Oh, yes, I'll learn to eat kosher. Oh, yes, I'll learn to keep Shabbat. Oh, yes, I'll learn to keep the Moedim. They're even willing to learn how not to mix the, the linen and the wool in their garments. But when you ask about a happy year, a lot of people, they're not really willing to back up because I don't really understand what you're getting at. Isn't it too late? Is it ever too late? If you were a new person in Messiah Yeshua, you can also make a new marriage in Messiah Yeshua. You can back that marriage up. I mean, first of all, if, that's, if there's problems there within that marriage, you got to admit it's wrong. Something is wrong here. We are not, you know, producing the fruit. We're unhappy. There's problems here. If you will first admit that doing it your way is not producing the results you want, then maybe you'll be willing to back up and start over doing it his way. According to it is written, 
not I feel or filling in the blame sentences. Because we all know when, when we start justifying our actions that we just start the blame game. Well, he did this. She did that. They never do this. They never do that. They always do this. He always does that. Well, see, that's not a solution. What about just backing up and doing the first thing the Father told us to do? I mean, it's just like children. A lot of times we want to run ahead and we want to do greater things. But as a father, why would you allow a child to take on some more advanced thing if the child refused to do the last thing you told that child to do? If they can't even take the first step properly, then how are you going to trust them with something really important? And sometimes repenting means to turn back, to turn around. Well, the whole point of turning around is let me come back here to the beginning or where I fell. And at that point, let me pick up, let me be obedient and move forward from there. Well, if our wives haven't had their happy years and there's problems in a marriage, then maybe at that point we want to repent and back up to that point and say, the point where I transgressed is the point where I'm going to begin moving forward. And so I am going to give, I'm going to try, I'm going to try it the Father's way. I'm going to try it, Adonis, we're just going to assume God is smarter than we are in terms of how we conduct ourselves in marriage. And assuming that he's smarter than I am, let me back up and do the first thing he told me to do as a husband. And I'm going to fulfill that commandment. I'm going to give her those 365 happy days. And if nothing changes at the end of it, then what have I lost? But you've been obedient. You obeyed his word. And no spirit-filled act of obedience to his word is going to return to you void. In one way or another, it's going to return to you and give you the fruit of those actions of trust and obedience to his word. So if you need to, back up and agree to a happier, but don't scare her to death if you've not been doing this before. When we come back, we'll get into a little more depth. Hello, this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. As a founding member of the Hebraic Roots Network, I hope that you'll consider a monthly support so that the Torah can go forth to the nations. There are three levels of support. There's a partner at $20 per month. There's Gideon's Army at $50 per month. Or you can participate as the Tabernacle Team at $100 per month. You can pledge this support at www.hebraicnetworks.com or at 1-800-657-9820. We thank you for any support that you can give, and may Adonai bless your home richly. Welcome back. All right. We've talked about the happy year. When we think of what's going on in the happy year, and again, it's not the impossible commandment. It's just a difficult one. Remember the promise to Adam as he was going to produce his bread by the sweat of his brow? So nothing worth doing is going to be easy. A happy year might take the sweat of your brow but it's going to pay off. It's going to yield something to you. And in terms of yielding that bread, remember that food that Exodus 21.10 talks about providing for your wife? You're going to be bread for your wife. You're going to meet those deepest needs because it's going to be your job every day to find out what makes you happy. How can I cheer you up today? What brings joy in your life? And you know what you're probably going to find out? If you've got a good wife, what you're going to find out is not going to be a new car. It's not going to be a new house. It's not going to be a new dress. What would truly and deeply make her happy is to have more of you. To actually have more of you in the commandment to reveal yourself to your wife, that inner flesh of Exodus 21.10. 
But if you will take your happy year and you will apply those principles of Exodus 21.10 at the same time in terms of moving beyond the physical, supply to your wife, to the spiritual, what you're actually learning to do is to make love to your wife pretty much the same way that Adonai made love to Israel in the wilderness. Where he, he talks in the prophets about the love that they had when she trusted him, when she followed him through a land not sown, through those desert places. And he wooed his people in the wilderness. And you know what? He follows his own rules. He keeps his own commandments because we know that in that wilderness walk that Adonai himself supplied these three irreducible needs of a wife. He himself fulfilled the obligations of a husband to a wife. Did he give them food? He did. He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them his inner flesh revealed in his word. And we know that that's what the manna was all about. It wasn't about just the physical bread. That it was actually the bread of heaven. It was his word being revealed to them daily. Revealing who he was. You want to know who God is? Who he is is revealed in the word itself. And so he gives them manna every day. He does not neglect. And in fact, on Shabbat, what's going to happen is twice as much is going to fall on Erev Shabbat so that they can rest together on Shabbat. So he's not even going to withhold that inner flesh, that essence of who he is on Shabbat. There will be plenty even for the seventh day. He's giving of himself. He's fulfilling his own commandment. They had coverings of clothes and shoes, and it says they didn't even wear out. And that's what Moses tells them. At the end of the journey, he says, your clothes haven't worn out. Your sandals are still good on your feet. Why? Because he's a good husband. He's doing his best to give them the joy and the happiness. And at the same time that he's covering them with physical clothes and physical shoes, the idea there is he also surrounded them or clothed them, at least in the Jewish tradition, with something called clouds of glory. And he gave them in the form of those pillars even that guided them and shielded them from their enemies. They're again extending to them a fulfillment of the commandment in a greater way than just the physical. Because what comes out of that cloud? Well, the will of Adonai is spoken out of that cloud. In fact, his presence is in that cloud. In fact, in that cloud, in that pillar of cloud, it says the angel of the presence is in there. He even has the power to forgive sin. In other words, it's authority. The angel of the presence is extending the father's authority to Israel, to the wife, covering her at the same time, shielding her, teaching her out of that cloud. You know, in those clouds of glory that protected them in the wilderness, um, they're considered Sukkot of glory. Because if you remember, as they came out of Egypt, the first stop was Sukkot. And according to the Jewish tradition, at that moment, Israel entered into clouds of glory or Sukkot of glory, which is representative of the marriage canopy. So as he pulls them into that marriage canopy, those clouds of glory, he is fulfill fulfilling exactly what we have said about the Kasuta. He's giving them physical clothes that will not wear out, physical shoes that will not wear out. But more importantly, he's giving them his spiritual protection. He is concealing them. And in the tradition, those clouds of glory, they protected their feet from the scorpions and from the serpents. 
They, the clouds would protect them from the heat of the sun by day uh, as walls around them to protect them from their enemies on every side exactly fulfilling what the definitions are of the kasuta that, that we looked into from Exodus 21.10. And so with that, we see that the spiritual authority is something that covers and conceals them, just like that commandment says. Now, what else did he give them? Well, remember the ona, it doesn't just mean conjugal rights, even though it's translated that way, it also means a time period, a period of dwelling together, specifically, um, a close physical attachment, to be in proximity to one another. Did he do that in the wilderness? You bet. In fact, he gives them the instructions to set up a tabernacle to ensure that he could dwell among them to dwell in their midst. And he went beyond that. He gave them set times for special intimacy, not just the daily service of the tabernacle, but he also gave them the Moedim. He gave them the appointed times. He gave them the weekly Shabbat. Not just times where his presence would dwell among them, but even special, special times when his presence would dwell among them. There were times when he spoke face to face with Moses, revealing again his inner flesh, revealing who he was to his people so that Moshe basically could pass it along to the people and they would know who their Redeemer was. They would know his essence. And the more a wife knows about who her husband is and the more he reveals of himself, typically the happier she becomes. Now, in terms of the impossible commandment, making your wife happy, if anybody took on a project, it was Adonai in the wilderness with Israel because that was one unhappy wife. She was not tickled to be there. But nevertheless, for 40 years, he persists. For 40 years, he puts food on the table. For 40 years, he puts clothes on her back. For 40 years, he meets her at the appointed times and dwells among her until she is ready and prepared to cross over and to make a transition. He's doing everything he can to bring her joy and happiness and spiritual growth in that relationship. And that's the point of you as a husband doing these things for your wife, to follow the pattern that Adonai set for you in the wilderness with Israel. It's more than just whether she has clothes on her back and the food on the table. You are actually nurturing her spiritual preparation and growth for a future event, a future experience, a future transition into a higher spiritual state because we know that there is going to be a millennial kingdom and we know there is going to be an eighth day. We know that there is an eternity and if we want to call it time, I don't know if we'll call it time, but there is existence beyond the existence that we know. There is time beyond the time that we know. Our time has limits and boundaries. It's a challenge, no doubt about it. It's a test. It's a hardship. And you can bet there's going to be death of the flesh along the way. And you know what? Men do tend to be more competitive um, we don't want to stereotype too much, but typically, who tunes into sports events? Who participates more in sports events? Women will compete, but men definitely win the prize on being attracted to competition. You're going to have more people with gambling problems that are males than females. Not that both can't have the problem, but they are going to dominate that category. They are built more competitive. And see, this is difficult because it's not your fault. Number one, men are wired a little bit differently because it is their responsibility 
to put the food on the table. In order to fulfill that commandment and to be obedient to that commandment, to put the food on the table and the clothes on the back, men do have to be more competitive. They, they do have to go out into the world and be able to obtain those things on behalf of their family. So it's necessary that they have a little more wiring in that direction in terms of being competitive. But what you have to remember is when you come home to your own house, when you have met those needs, you don't have to continue competing. It's, it's not really a race when you step over the threshold into your own home. In other words, the way you conduct your affairs out in that world of work is not necessarily a life skill that will apply to your home life. That, that competitive edge, that analytical edge that, that helps you bring in that income, that may actually become counterproductive if you try to exercise it within your home because it's not necessarily the same skills are applied. And that's why we have these commandments in place to help men take off that competitive edge as they arrive at home and understand this is my safe place. This is where I don't have to be competitive. I'm not in a competition with my wife by any means because there wouldn't be any point in finishing first. If I'm in a yoke, and I finish first, it means we probably went the wrong way. If you're going to move a yoke, both parties have to move forward in the same direction at the same time, at the same rate of speed. If you violate that, then you'll end up turning and pulling in directions that aren't good, and you probably just won't get very far anyway. So it's not the same skills. It's not a race where you finish first. In fact, in terms of bringing happiness into a marriage and meeting needs, it's not a competitive thing, right? It's, it's never a, a matter of trying to outdo one another within the boundaries of a marriage. It's teamwork. We're on the same team. The moment you start competing with one another, you start losing the game. When we're, if you want to look at it as a game, that's when you start losing. If you let's look at maybe at a basketball team or at uh, tennis doubles, if you start competing against your own team, then it's not that the other team wins. It's that you forfeit. All they have to do is stand there while you destroy yourself. All right? So in a marriage, there's, there's no point to competing there's no point to having the last word. And the, the idea that my way or the highway, counterproductive. Sometimes you have a choice. You can be right or you can have relationship, but you can't have both, not at that moment. And so understanding that, sometimes what is right is purely subjective. Remember, in, in, in terms of when we think we're right, we're going to be wrong a certain percentage of the time. Even when we are statistically, we believe ourselves to be 100% right, there is a certain percentage of the time that we will be wrong. And it's just a given. It's a scientifically proven fact. All right? So, understand that being right, I might think I'm right right now, but I might have additional information in the future that makes me look back and think, why in the world did I believe that or think that was so important? Why did I think being right in that argument was more important than maintaining a happy relationship? But when that competitive edge comes in, and trust me, that competitive edge, if you carry it too far, then what you're manifesting is the spirit of Cain. Now remember, this really doesn't have much to do with 
the actual offerings that he brought, but it has to do with his reaction. When Abel's sacrifice gained respect, but his didn't, he saw it as a point of competition, not as a point of correction or relationship or correction to the relationship with his brother. And it says, it kind of leaves an open-ended sentence as it talks about what happens with the true brothers. And, and basically, one speaks to the other and the sentence drops off. And you don't know what happened. But the idea is that it happened out in the field. The field, contextually, a lot of times in Scripture, is a place of choice. It's a place for the beasts, the beasts of the field, where there is a state of competition. There is a predatory thing that goes on in the field. It's what can I prevail over? What can I control? What can I have? The flip side to that is Isaac, who sowed in the field and meditated in the field. He meditates in the field, and he looks up, and he sees his wife. So when you get into the field, it's not to bring you into a sense of competition with your wife, but to see your wife. And in the, the scriptural sense, to see her doesn't just mean looking up and seeing a woman standing there. It means to see who she is, to see her essence, to see who she is. Just as much as she wants you to reveal yourself to her, she wants you to see her. And to see her essence. And it says when Rebecca saw Isaac, she basically takes a veil and covers her face. Why? Because that's the covering of Isaac. She can see right there that he intends to fulfill the commandment concerning her. To cover her with his authority. To trust her. His heart will safely trust in her. He's going to put food on the table, but he's going to reveal himself. What does it say? He took her into his mother's tent to reveal himself to her, to have that dialogue with her. And she covers herself saying, okay, this is the one that I will become one with. I am going to do him good. And that happens in the field. So you can either see your wife and cultivate your relationship with your wife. And another thing he did, it says he sowed in the field and reaped a hundredfold. When you conduct your relationship with your wife at that level where you were sowing your inner flesh into her, in that spiritual sense, you are going to reap a hundredfold from that relationship because you are keeping the Torah the same way that Adonai did. But when you enter into that field and you enter into competition with her, then you are not going to produce a hundredfold unless it's a hundredfold of bad seed. Things that you wouldn't want replanted. It's not going to bear good fruit. In other words, if we can think of competition as the spirit of Cain, when, when we get upset, when someone else gets attention, all right, or when someone else holds the high ground, if that makes us so upset that we're like Cain, that our countenance falls and we begin to sulk and have tantrums and so forth or be passive or stay away or separate or whatever little techniques we have to punish the other person, that's the spirit of Cain. That's throwing a tantrum. As my old professor used to say, my dear, we call that a tantrum. It's just acting out, all right? It's nothing that needs to be diagnosed other than I have given in to a spirit of competition. And if I'm not going to get the same respect as this other person, or I'm not going to feel as right or as valued as this other person, then I'm going to have my little hissy fit or my silent treatment or whatever I use in order to what we believe is leveling the playing field, that's not what we're doing. We're just tipping it even farther. And we're destroying that field for use to sow good seed. Marriage is not a race. But if it were, 
a race. For men, this sounds crazy, but you're only going to win the race when you finish second. And that's true of most relationships. If we conduct a relationship with another person, a friendship, a peer relationship, a marriage, a, you know, whatever, work relationship, if we constantly try to surpass a team member, then we're not really winning. We're destroying the whole point of the relationship. In fact, if in your mind, let me finish second, like Yeshua said, if you go into a wedding banquet or some sort of gathering, and there's all sorts of places at the table, don't go to the head of the table where all the important people are. Seat yourself down at the other end where the less esteemed people are. And he says, if that's where you belong, then obviously you're not going to have any embarrassment. But if you seat yourself up here with the important people and the host comes in and sees you, but he sees somebody else who he prefers, he's going to make you get up and move down to the end of the table and put the other person up there. And then you're going to be humiliated. Well, when you always want to win every argument, every decision, and so forth, and to subjugate others to your will, what you are, in essence, doing is seating yourself at the head of the table every time. But there will come a time when the, the host will come in and move you down to the end until you learn to like it there. That's the way our Father disciplines us. And so it's a matter of, you know what, I'm, I'm finding myself in a, a dispute an argument, a disagreement. We've got two different ideas about how this thing should go. You know, unless it's going to cause a loss of life and limb, let me choose in this particular instance to put myself second. I'm just going to say up front, you win. I'm second. Go ahead. You know, when you do that, people tend to say, oh, no, you go first. You know, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of times just the fact that you will relinquish the right to be right, that will soften something in the other person because once that spirit of competition just kind of <sighs> ratchets down in you, then if they felt they had to rise to that to survive, and they see they no longer need this to survive in the relationship or the argument, then their level will drop as well. Because for them, it was a survival skill. This person's going to run all over me if I don't stand up. All right? When you just say, okay, I'm second. Let's try it your way. That's often, not always, but that's often where that person will also ratchet down and say, well, now let's talk about it. Let's compromise here. There's something here where we can both be happy and both be a little bit unhappy. In a marriage, if you allow yourself to get into those competitive spikes, talk to yourself. It's okay to talk to yourself. If you need to walk outside, walk in the bedroom, go for a drive, and have a conversation with yourself, because see, the nefesh is never going to believe what I'm saying. The nefesh is never going to want to hear, finish second. All right, that's your soul. That's your bundle of appetites, emotions, desires, and your intellect. Even your intellect will tell you it's counterintuitive to give somebody else the victory. But it's the strongest thing you can ever do is to relinquish victory, especially the more competitive you are. Some people aren't that competitive. So some of them need to be more competitive because they never get anything done. But a lot of times it's knowing when to apply the brakes and say, if I keep pushing the gas on this, all I'm going to do is run off the road. I'm going to run off in the ditch and I'm going to wrap the car around a tree. If I keep my foot on the gas pedal in this argument, it's only going to ultimately, ultimately be counterproductive because we get caught up in the argument and the heat of the argument or the disagreement and we truly fail to see the consequences of winning. 
We think we must win at all costs. We must be acknowledged as the repository of all wisdom at all costs. No, it will cost you something for that position. It will cost you something to win. And maybe not today, maybe not next week, maybe not even 10 years from now. Well, you see the folly of that. But you know what? In your old age, you will look back and you will say, what a fool I was to sabotage relationship for the sake of being right over something that I can't even remember what the argument was about anymore. We get caught up in those sorts of things. And so don't get caught up in the race, husbands, with your wives. You can finish first, actually, when you finish second. Because what's going to happen is you'll finish together, yoke together, step by step, going in the right and the same direction. We'll see you next time.